All right, guys, so we're going to start now, and I want to welcome everybody to the presentation. So today we're going to be speaking about uh, competitive analysis, how your competitors are, are beating you from an SEO perspective. The cool thing about SEO is that you can clearly see who the winners and losers are. So the winners, of course, are the people who are ranking ahead of you, and the losers are the people who are on page two and beyond. So we're going to teach you guys how to do a couple things to rank as high as you possibly can from an SEO perspective by using some of your, SEO, excuse me, your competitor strategies against them. So the first thing we want to cover is if you want to follow us on Twitter, Stream Companies, we're a company here in um, Old City, Philadelphia. We also have an office in Malvern, Pennsylvania. We're doing pretty well. So if you want to follow us on Twitter, we are at Stream Companies is the Twitter handle. And if you want to live, live tweet this or keep up with all the mentions of the, the seminar, the webinar during this time, our hashtag is Streaminar. So my name is Napoleon Suarez. I'm the director of SEO here at Stream Companies. I manage a team of SEO professionals. We do some pretty cool stuff for our clients, and a lot of our clients are automotive-related clients, but we have clients in the e-commerce space. We have a bunch of clients that do some pretty cool things in the education space as well. So I've been doing SEO for about six years now, and my goal is just to drive top rankings, quality traffic, and qualified leads. And my approach to SEO is strictly white hat stuff, strictly stuff that abides by Google's guidelines and the, or the rest of the search engine's guidelines. And kind of slow and steady to help my clients build sustainable businesses. If you want to follow my Twitter, I don't tweet as much about SEO stuff, but if you want to follow my Twitter and see the SEO stuff that I do tweet, I am at Napoleon Suarez, and I'll share that a little later in the presentation. We'll also have questions at the end, too, so please save those for the end. So if you can, you can either add them to the go-to meeting section for the question section, or you can just hold them to the end and not open the floor for everybody. So what are we going to be talking about today when we're talking about doing a competitive analysis? So this web webinar is kind of geared towards two different people. The first one is the person that's been doing SEO for a couple of years now or for a significant amount of time. You're on the first page of Google, but you just can't seem to overtake the people that are ranking ahead of you. So whether you're ranking number five and want to get to number four, or you're ranking number two and you want to get to number one, there's some things that, the, that your competitors are doing, at least the ones that are ranking ahead of you, that you want to pay attention to so that you can reverse engineer their strategy, do, do it a little better than they can and beat them at, at their own game. Or this is for the person who is thinking of entering a particular industry and you want to find out what's, what are some best practices to do, what are some things to do to get started. You're not ranking anywhere in the top 100, but you want to be, and you know you want to start off on the right foot. So whether you're just starting out your business or thinking of starting one or you've been in the game for a couple of years now, this you can sure, you'll sure to be learn, able to learn something from the presentation today. So why do we want to outrank our competitors for our particular keywords? Everything that we do SEO related comes down to three things, and we can pretty much sum these up the same way every single time. And this is what we do for our clients here at Stream Companies. We want to drive rankings, of course. Our, our, one of our goals is to help our clients rank as high as they possibly can for the money keywords. But it's, that's not the end result. We want to drive rankings so that we can drive traffic by increasing click-through rates and then having, increasing the amount of people that come to the client's website for their money keywords. And that's important because we want to be able to drive sales and leads so that they can generate money for their business for their businesses, which is pretty much the reason why we started our businesses in the first place. So I want to start with an example here. So if I Google the term Halloween costumes, Halloween is surprisingly close now, but if I Google the term Halloween costumes, Google has used an algorithm, a ranking system to rank web pages for this particular keyword. And of course, Many people don't go past page one, so most people want to rank in the top ten for this particular keyword. So we have a list here of websites that are ranking in the top six or seven so far here, but we want to know how did they get there, and if they got there already, what are they doing to stay there? Because we know that SEO isn't something that you set and forget. It's something that you have to maintain. So what did our, clients, what did our competitors do to earn the right to rank highly for this money keyword, and what are, they, what are their strategies that they're using to, to stay in this position? So ultimately, the goal is to rank number one for the keywords that get the most traffic. And there's different ways and different, different strategies that we can use to improve our ranking to get to the number one spot. So of course, one of them is keywords, which is kind of the foundation of any SEO campaign. We want to be able to develop a keyword list that allows us to drive relevant traffic to our website. If we're 
in the auto in the marketing auto uh, excuse me marketing automation space that's going to be one of our major keywords and we've had to figure out a way to find all the iterations of the term marketing automation so that we can rank well for them the next thing is links so by developing great keywords over time it's going to be necessary that you drive links to your websites. And if you ask any SEO professional in the game right now, they pretty much say that links are ranking pretty high up there as far as ranking is concerned. So the more quality links that you have pointing to your site, the better your site's going to rank for your particular keywords. Content is important, of course, because the better content you have, the more links that you're going to generate, which will help you rank better for your keywords. Similarly, architecture is important, kind of the way that your website is coded so that you can Make sure that when you are driving SEO traffic, excuse me, SEO value to your website, you are properly funneling that to the pages that need that value. Strategic hiring is important. We want to stay ahead of the game and find out what are our clients doing, what are our competitors doing from a hiring perspective to bring more talent into their into their office. What are they doing as far as expansion is concerned? Also, we'll touch on social media and how that plays in rankings and how we can kind of dissect what our competitors are doing from a social media perspective. And lastly, reputation management and just the the, I guess the value of your brand on the web. So as I explained a little bit earlier, the keywords are the number one focus for the, I guess the foundation of a campaign. So we want to make sure that we have a list of, of really good keywords that we can concentrate on so that we can drive rankings for those keywords. And so Everyone wants to rank number one in Google, of course. That's the goal. And anybody that's probably on this webinar right now has probably got an email from somebody somewhere in some country, somewhere far from where they live, that says, we guarantee you number one search engine results. And since none of us know what Google's algorithm is, even people that work at Google don't know what the algorithm is completely, it's impossible to know what that is. So to, get, to guarantee something using data that's incomplete is very difficult to do. So what they really mean, and people, when they want to rank number one in Google, what they really mean is saying, we want to rank number one in Google for the terms that are most important to our business. Of course, if I want to rank number one in Google for the term Napoleon Suarez, that wouldn't be very difficult because aside from my dad, I only know one other person. So it wouldn't be hard because it's not that much competition behind that term and it doesn't get that much search volume. However, Halloween costumes is a different, is a different animal. So to rank number one for that would take a significant amount more of resources. So, how do I find out what my competitors are focusing on, the major keywords? Maybe they're focusing on more terms than I am. Maybe they're focusing on the better terms that are more important to the business. And how do I uncover relevant terms that get less competition yet drive relevant um, visits to my website? So the first thing I like to do is I like to run a Google search for the brand name of my competitor and pay attention to the things that pop up in the search engine results page, specifically Google. So I used an example here called Marketo, and they offer marketing automation software, which I alluded to a little bit earlier, but let's say I didn't know that. So I typed in Marketo's brand into Google, and Google spits out a list of links that have some content within those links. So of course, by Googling Marketo, I see here that the first one is a paid ad. I see B2B and B2C demand gen software, which seems to be a keyword that they're focusing on. Also some site links underneath of that, which is the guide to marketing automation and a definitive guide to lead scoring. And in the organic section, I can see that in their title tag, which tends to be the most important part, at least one of the most important parts of on-page SEO, I can see that they use the term marketing automation software there. And within the description, you can tell they use other things such as email, social analytics, and lead management. So the very first place that I would normally start if I want to find out what keywords our, our competitors are focusing on is just search for their brand within Google and see what comes up. There's a list of of terms and a list of brands that show up underneath of these that you can also pay attention to, but just for space's sake, I only included a couple here. So let's just say I didn't want to do that or for whatever reason a client wasn't, a competitor wasn't doing SEO and I'm kind of coming in and being the first person to do SEO within the space. Maybe they didn't use particular keywords in the title tag or the description and maybe not, nobody in the industry is using SEO or best practices yet. So a good thing for Google or a good thing for us is that Google has a tool where you can take a website, any website you want, dump it in there, and it will spit out a bunch of keywords for you. So in this instance, I took Marketo.com, and I dumped them into Google's AdWords tool, and it spit out a bunch of keywords that it thinks are really important with, with regard to the Marketo site. So I have a couple of things here. The first thing I pay attention to is kind of skipping down towards the bottom here is the term marketing automation. And people can you can see here that it has the most amount of search volume and it has the highest competition, or at least one of the highest levels of competition here. 
So most SEO people in the industry would probably focus on that term first, marketing automation. It is a big term and it's probably the term that gets the most volume out of all the terms within their business. However, the smart SEO people won't just focus on that term. They'll understand that marketing automation consists of some of these other terms here, such as the definitive guide to lead nurturing, the uh, revenue performance management, email marketing, and all these other terms. And you can see that the term definitive guide to lead nurturing, while a lot of people would ignore this because it doesn't get a significant amount of search volume and the competition isn't very high, that's one of the reasons why I would focus on this term. Because that tells me that this term isn't as competitive, so therefore it's going to be a lot easier for me to drive rankings for this term, whereas marketing automation may take six months to a year to rank pretty well for that one, or at least to get on page one. It may take me only a couple of weeks to rank number one for the definitive guide to lead nurturing. And depending upon how much pressure you have from your boss to drive business to your website, it may be more lucrative to concentrate on this top term first that gets less search volume. Also, if you concentrate on enough terms that get, uh, I guess, a small portion of, of the entire search volume within that industry, if you focus on 100 so I guess terms that get 12 searches each, that'll be 1,200 total, and it'll be a lot easier to rank for those terms. And there'll be less competition around those, and you'll be able to see more, more I guess, sales and leads come to your website because of that. Also, they have an option to download all this stuff. So what you can do is you can download this, this list here to a CSV, and you can prioritize these keywords so that you can start generating content around them. So from keywords, by looking at your, what your competitors are doing, what are some things that you can learn? Of course, you can figure out what keywords they're, they're focusing on. You can know that, okay, marketing automation is a big term, but maybe I should concentrate on some of these lower hanging fruit ones that get less competition. So what are, other, some, what are some of the other relevant lower competition terms that you can focus on to drive leads and sales right now? Some of the action items, of course, download the CSV, prioritize this keyword list. Whoever your content people are on your team, or you may just be that content person, now you know what keywords you have to focus on to create content around. Also, you can uncover these less competitive but topical keywords that are going to drive traffic, and they're going to be, it's going to take you less time to drive traffic for, around these keywords. And as I mentioned before, you can create a site mentioning these keywords or a blog that mentions content around these keywords. So the next section is link building. And as I mentioned, you can ask any SEO professional in the business right now, and they'll say that link building is very important from an SEO perspective. Just to kind of do a brief rundown of why it's so important, a link would be a clickable reference to another site or basically me voting for another site saying it's, it's important. The more links you get equals the more votes. The more votes you get equals the more SEO value that flows to your site. And the more SEO value that you drive to your site, the higher your rank for your keywords, the more traffic you'll drive, and the more sales that you'll drive. So let's go back to the Halloween costumes example here. So when I did a search for this, we can see that the top ranking for this particular term was Party City. They're ranking number one for this term, and you can see in the title tag there that they use the term Halloween costumes for kids and adults. So I want to find out what did they do from a link building perspective to earn the right from Google to rank here. So there's a tool out there called Open Site Explorer. If you just type opensiteexplorer.com into, uh, into your browser, this will come up. It's a, a moz.com tool. I think it's great for a couple of reasons. One, because it's inexpensive to use if you want to buy the pro version. They do a really good job of, of, of customer service. And let's just say you don't have the 99 bucks per month to pay for it. They do have a free version. It's limited, but you can still, if you're just starting out, you can get some pretty valuable information, and it'll give you a list of all the, I guess, higher prioritized links that a client or a competitor has, has earned so far. So what I did is I took this partycity.com slash category slash Halloween plus costumes dot do URL, dropped it into Open Site Explorer, as you can see towards the bottom there, and this is what got spit out. So what I did is I filtered this list of, of links that shows up to only include the external links. I did that because it's going to be very difficult to convince. If I'm a competitor of Party City, it's going to be a very it's going to be very difficult to convince Party City internally on their own website to link to a competitor. So I want to, I want to find out all the websites that are linking to PartyCities.com Halloween page, that specific page, as opposed to that domain because PartyCity.com offers more than just Halloween costumes. So if I offer Halloween costumes, I want to find out exactly how many external links are voting for or vouching for this particular Halloween costumes page. And by doing this, I can find out what it's going to take for me to be successful within this space from a link building perspective. So as we can see here, uh, Open Site Explorer, which is powered by Moz.com and powered by their Linkscape tool, lets me know that a link on HuffingtonPost.com, which, which was posted back in October of 2012, is mentioning and linking to PartyCity.com's Halloween costumes page. 
and they're using the anchor text, which is the text that they use to link to that particular URL as Halloween costumes for kids and as spice as adults there. So as you and I both know, Huffington Post is a pretty big resource. So if I'm ranking number two and Party City's ranking number one and I go through my backlink profile and I realize that I don't have any links for anything close to the Huffington Post or the New York Times or something similar, that lets me know that I have work to do. So the cool thing about this is that, as you can see in the upper right-hand corner, is that Open Site Explorer gives you the option to export all this data to a CSV. So you can narrow this data down and you can prioritize this data so that the higher page authority, which is the ranking authority, excuse me, the ranking potential of that particular URL, those pages show up towards the top. And also the domain authority, which is the ranking potential of the domain as a whole, those, those URLs will normally show up to the top. But if you're in an industry that's just getting started, or you're, you're a website that's just getting started, it may be difficult to reach out to the Huffington Post and say, hey, can you please link to me? So you may want to start close to the bottom, maybe the page authority somewhere in the 20s and 30s, but it's still worth a shot to reach out to the Huffington Post since this was published back in 2012 and say something to the effect of, I noticed that you posted a article on your website about Halloween costumes in 2012. Would you like to do a 2013 version of that? So from a link building perspective, by using Open Site Explorer, what can we learn? So we can learn where they're getting their links from and how they're getting their links, what type of links they're targeting. Are they going after .edu links, .org links? Are they doing press, or press release type of campaign? Are they doing contests? What exactly are they doing to earn their links? Which ones are the most valuable? Of course, you can find that out by filtering by page or domain authority. And which anchor text are they targeting? I'll go back to this previous slide here, and you can see that one of the reasons why they're ranking so well for the term Halloween costumes is that, I guess, four out of their top five links have the term Halloween costumes in their anchor text. So something to pay attention to when you're doing your research as well. So some of the action items would be to download the CSV that you can take directly from Open Site Explorer, prioritize your list, and do some outreach. You can find out the contact information of the people that have written these things by following their blog or following them on, tip, on Twitter. You can also uncover less competitive but topical keywords by focusing on some of the link anchor text that's outlined here in Open Site Explorer. So anybody that's been doing SEO is probably familiar with this guy, Matt Cutts. Whenever you ask him a question, his answer to that question is always something just to the effect of just create great content. It's very vague, but I think they do that on purpose. So we want to find out exactly within a, a specific space what content is your competition creating and what does good content look like because we want to be able to emulate that content if they have some good stuff on their website and we want to be able to learn from what they're creating and see how often they're creating it. So once again, I use Open Site Explorer for something like this, and I'm a big sneaker guy. So I use a website called NiceKicks.com as a reference here. And whereas before we were focusing on the inbound links tab in Open Site Explorer, in this instance we'll be focusing on the top pages tab. So by dropping Nice, nice Kicks into Open Site Explorer and selecting top pages, I can see the list of pages that Open Site Explorer thinks are the most important on the web. So of course the the home page is going to be the most important page with any domain most times, only because people normally link to the home page in most instances, and also it just typically has the most um, domain authority. So I can see here that they have a section called Air Jordans where the Air Jordan section has earned 20,000 links from 75 different linking root domains. So that tells me if pe people only link to stuff that, and vote for things that they really like. So this tells me that on this website, their Air Jordan section is the most popular page on this website aside from the home page. And also gives HTTP status codes, which I'll go over a little bit later. So this, when I click on that page, that Air Jordan's page, this is pretty much what it looks like. And it's just a list of all the Jordans that came out, along with an image and a link that you can click on and see a little bit more information. So if I am new to this space and I want to rank well for Air Jordan's terms or Air Jordan release dates, which Nice Kicks does, then this would be the first place that I would start. I would look at this content and I would say, how can I make this content better? Can I add videos to this? Can I make this more comprehensive? This goes 1 to 12. Right now, the screenshot that I did, but there's been almost 30 pairs that have come, 30 different pairs that have come out. This doesn't have a list of all the different colorways. This doesn't have any images of people wearing them on their feet. Just how can I make this content a little bit better and add value here so that I can reach out to these so the, to these 75 different websites and say, hey, I noticed that you linked to something on Nice Kicks website, which is an Air Jordans section. I took what they had and I made it better. If you want to link to a better, more comprehensive resource and make your section a little bit stronger, 
would you be willing to consider this? And of course, of these 75 linking loop domains here, everybody's not going to say yes, but if you can get five to 10 of these, that's better than what your competitor's doing. All right, so I also use search operators to find out what's important on a client's website. So there's a whole list of search operators that if you email me, I'll send you a link to it and, uh, and um, you'll be able to research this on your own. But basically, what a search operator does is makes it easier for you to find certain things on the web and find certain things within certain websites. So one website that I, I respect a lot is seerinteractive.com. And by typing into the Google search bar, site colon seerinteractive.com, I'm telling Google to return all the pages that are most important on this particular domain. So it doesn't happen all the time, but typically Google returns websites in order of importance, or excuse me, URLs in order of importance for a specific website. So by clicking, by selecting site colon seerinteractive.com, I can see here that this rcs.seerinteractive.com URL is the second most popular URL on this particular domain. So it makes sense because they built this within the last year or two, and a lot of people link to it. A lot of people were talking about this on the web, on Twitter, and Facebook, so it makes sense that this would be the uh, this would rank pretty high within the um, CR Interactive domain. So what I would do is I would look at that particular resource, and I would ask the same question that I asked earlier from the nice kicks example. I would say, how can I make this resource better and more comprehensive? Also, the this. These previous ways that I showed you are ways that you can find out what's most important on a client's site from a content perspective by you doing the research and going out and finding that information. But I'm a lazy guy sometimes, and I like to have that information come to me. So what I like to do with my clients and their competitors is I like to subscribe to the competitors' newsletters. So there's nothing that a person or a website or a company likes to do more than say how awesome they are. And they love to send out email newsletters to all the people that have subscribed for them and say everything that they've been doing and share all of the business. So instead of clicking around the website and finding out what type of client they're create, excuse me, what type of content they're creating and how frequently they're creating it, I, I'll go to their website, sign up for their newsletter so it'll automatically come to my email inbox. I would be smart about this guys and use an alias email address. It doesn't look good if because you're I'm pretty sure that your your competitors can see who's subscribed to their newsletter. It doesn't look as good and it's not as stealthy if you're subscribing to your competitor's newsletter using the competitor's email address. So what I would do is create some type of fictitious Gmail account and have things forwarded to you. It looks a little bit better. So what do we learn from this content section? What, are, what is the content using, excuse me, what, what content is a competitor using to attract their links? What is the top content on their site? How can we digest that so that we can create some better stuff on our website? And the action items would be to do just that. Figure out what they're doing, do it better, make it more comprehensive, add value to it so that we can convince people to link to us. Subscribe to the email list to get all that content delivered directly to you so you don't have to spend a ton of time going out doing this research. And if the content is timely, be ahead of the competition here. So certain industries, a 2012 version comes out, a 2013 version comes out, and you better believe that a 2014 version is coming out. If you know that 2014 version comes out in October of the previous year, maybe you come out with that 2014 version in September, beat them to the punch and build authority on the web and build history, which the search engines love, and then you can have the potential to rank better for those particular keywords that are targeted to that page. So architecture. I'm not going to spend too much time on this here because Google's pretty smart with digesting just about any type of code that the Internet can throw at it. But it is important to pay attention to how your clients are moving or what their strategy is from an architecture slash coding perspective on the site. So you do want to find out what are they doing from a coding perspective. And if you're new to the game, what platform should I use if you're going to enter an industry where things are pretty much templated? So what I like to do is if I'm working within an industry and I'm doing research, I'll run a Google search for my keyword. I'll check out the top three or four results, and I'll see what CMS, which content management system they're using. If you're new to the game and, you, and let's say you're building a sneaker blog and you're finding that of all the sneaker blogs out there, the, of the top 10, 80% of them are using WordPress. That's a pretty good indication that you should probably use WordPress. Not to say that you have to, but you can tell that Google's showing a little bit more love to the WordPress sites and for some reason within that industry people like using WordPress. Normally SEO people are fans of WordPress, but that, was, that would be the way that I would do my research if I want to find out what platform that I want to use to add content to. So we deal with a lot of auto dealers here at Stream Companies, and we found it that we found that a lot of auto dealers standardized on a website that was created by Dealer.com. And whenever I'm doing SEO for this for Dealer.com stuff, I pay attention to what the what the competitors are doing. 
if all of our competitors and we are using dealer.com and one of our clients are using dealer.com, it's pretty safe to say that whatever limitations that our client has, our competition has the same limitations. So I wouldn't spend too much time going back to dealer.com, seeing if they can do all types of custom things for you. I would prioritize and pick your battles there. But keep in mind that whatever limitations you have, your competitors are going to have the same ones. So Google's smart enough to know that everybody in the industry uses dealer.com, at least the auto dealers do, and that there's an issue with 301 redirects and there's an issue with duplicate content. Of course, Google isn't going to penalize everybody for that if 90% of the industry is using it. So don't spend too much time there focusing on that. I have something in here about broken links. I was going to include in the link building section, but because this involves issues on a client's site, I decided to include it in the architecture section. So a broken link basically is a link that returns a 404 status code on a client's website. And what that means for, from us, for us SEO professionals is that's lost SEO value. And that lost SEO value can be an opportunity for you to claim that and for you to drive SEO value to your site and capture what was lost from the competitor. So I like wine and I follow some wine blogs, but let's just say I was a wine blog that was new to the industry or I was a wine blog that's ranking somewhere on page two or towards the bottom of page one for terms like wine blog. So by searching for wine blog on, the, on Google, I know that that gets a significant amount of search volume and the higher I rank for that, the more people are going to come to my wine blog and the more people are going to see my ads there and I'm going to drive more revenue and more readers to my site. So when I did a search for this, I realized that a, realized that a website called Vintank.com is ranking really well for wine terms. So what I'm looking for is what are, where are areas where they have broken links on their website and did these broken links get any links from any other outside resources? And could I get those links pointed to me now since these outside resources are now linking to a web page on Vintank.com that does not that no longer exist? So what I did is I went to the top pages section in Open Site Explorer again and I typed in Vintank.com and it spit out a bunch of bunch of URLs here within, within that Vintank domain and it also returned HTTP status symbols. So I know that a 200 status code says that the page loads correctly and there's no issues. I know that a 301 status code is a permanent redirect that transfers SEO value, but I also know that a 404 status code means that that particular URL is broken and it's not loading for whatever reason. So it seems like once upon a time, Vintank had some content on this slash question mark P equals 121 URL. It must have been pretty good because 13 different websites linked to it 59 times and be Basically what that means is that 13 websites are linking to a URL on Vintank.com that no longer exists. So webmasters tend to like to keep very clean web pages and they don't like to have bad links or broken links on their web page because it makes for a bad user experience. So what I do is I would reach out to, excuse me, what I would do is I would reach out to the pages that are linking to this broken link here and I would find out if they would be willing to link to a resource that actually does exist. So how do I find all the URLs that are linking to this Vintank.com slash question mark P equals 121 page? So I copy and paste this URL that I know is broken. I put it into Open Site Explorer and I filter by all the external links pointing to just this page. And you can see here that Open Site Explorer gave me 48 external links that are linking to this particular page. And it also prioritizes them by page authority and also domain authority if you want. So I can see here that this website, winelog.net slash blogs, etc., is linking to Vintank.com using the Vintank anchor text. However, they probably don't know because this resource may be old and they don't go on their um, old URLs and update things. They probably don't know that this link to Vintank.com is broken. So it takes somebody smart like us SEO people to reach out to them and say, hey, look, you're linking to a competitor's website that's broken and it's about wine. I have a blog here that has some great information about wine. Would you be willing to link to it? It makes a lot of sense for the webmaster because the webmaster has to go into the code and get rid of this link that's, re that's linking to a broken resource anyway. So it's really easy for you to replace something with uh, another URL if they're going to be in the code already. It also shows some good karma that you're willing to help them out with updating their website. So um, it seems like this strategy has been working pretty well for me. You also have the option to export to a CSV so that you can prioritize all these links that are linking to a broken resource on a competitor's website. So something I, I this isn't the exact template email that I send to these webmasters, but it goes something similar to high site owner. And notice that they're linking to a broken page. If you want a replacement, here's a quality substitute, blah, blah, blah. I make them feel warm and fuzzy inside. And I would say if I reach out to 100 of these, 15 to 20 of them will say, thanks for the update. Thank you. I definitely will add it. Most of them will say no, but 50% uh, close rate on link building, if, if any of you know how, to, how link building is done, is a pretty good rate. 
So what do I learn from this? I learn about limitations that a CMS has, that a content management system has. Everybody's probably going to have the same ones if the industry is standardized on a set of CMSs that they all use. What features do they offer? Do they offer blog, video? If so, how do I take advantage of that? And how are my competitors taking advantage of that? Does Google favor one over the other? Going back to the WordPress example for sneaker blogs, what are, what are the costs of these? And you can do research around these to find out who's spending what on what particular CMS. What does the industry have to say about it? I'm sure there's certain forums that the industry have started or different things on the web that the industry is speaking about. And what value can you add? I know here at Stream Companies, we're developing a back-end of CMS for car dealers now where all the SEO issues that we're seeing with some of the, the dealer.com sites and some of the other competitors, we're able to capitalize off of that and make sure that we have all the SEO best practices baked, baked into our system. So again, action items, don't sweat the small stuff. If everybody has the same issue, just keep plugging along and find something else to work on. Use what Google likes, find broken links, prioritize them, and start reaching out. So one thing that I like to do, too, is pay attention to hiring practices of competitors. So typically, if you're not doing so well, you're letting people go. If you are doing well, you're hiring. So wouldn't it be great to know that, oh, okay, my competitors are doing very well. Let's use the auto industry as an example. If I sell Nissans in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and the competitor is selling Nissans in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and I know that they're hiring, that means that they're doing very well. So I should pay close attention to what they're doing from a link building perspective, what they're doing from a content perspective, and all the other things before this, because it seems that they're doing it very, very well. And also, this, I took this directly from Faulkner Nissan's. I hope none of you guys out there work for Faulkner Nissan, but I took this directly from their homepage. So it seems that if a company is growing, they love to tell everybody about it. I'm sure this would be in their newsletter as well. But I found this just by going to the homepage, clicking around, and notice that they're hiring people. So to take strategic hiring a bit further, you can use this kind of as, as a way to find out exactly where your competitor is going next. So HomeJoy, which is a website that allows you to sign up for professional home cleaning. They want to rank for terms like home cleaning, professional home cleaning, things like that, home services. They want to rank for those terms. So when I did a search for that and I went to the jobs page, I found out that they're hiring an Android developer, which you can see here, a software engineer for Android. And you can see that this is their first Android developer. I noticed that they're working towards, I think they have an iOS app already, but they don't have an Android app. So I wouldn't know that they would be working towards getting an Android app created if I didn't go to their job section. So if you want to find out what your competitors are working on next and where they're going to be, go to the job section. Even if you're in sales, go to the job section to find out who they're hiring and where they're looking to grow so that you can capitalize off of that. So what does this mean? Where's the comp competition expanding? Not just different verticals or different industries, but where? Are, are they looking for people in, on, is their business located on the West Coast and they're looking for people on the East Coast? Are they looking for people in different countries? This can mean that they're expanding nationally or globally. What industries are the competitions is expanding to? Is this time for you to innovate or, or offer a different service? And whether a company is growing or not. If they're not hiring, they're probably staying stagnant. If they are hiring, they're growing, and you need to, to take heed on what's going on. So continue to innovate. Beat your competitor to the punch. If you do know they're hiring or you do know they're coming out with an Android app and you have an Android app coming out, make sure you hustle to get yours out before them so that you can strike first. And use the reputation of your company, assuming you have a better reputation, use the reputation of your, co your company to attract better talent. If you're hiring and they're hiring, maybe take out some PPC ads using their brand name so that people that would consider joining their company can also take a look at yours. So social media. So we, uh, as social media starts to play more of a role in the search algorithm, we're, we're tending to pay more attention to it. So I used iMore here. They are a pretty much a, an Apple blog, like a rumors blog, some of the Mac rumors. So let's say I want to start some type of iPhone blog, or let's say I'm starting a business that offers, I guess, different products or accessories that go with an iPhone or an iPad. So I want to find out, or I want to be where people are that are going to be paying attention to this type of stuff. So I, let's say I want to start a Twitter page, or I already have a Twitter page, but I'm not sure on the frequency as far as how much I should be tweeting or sending updates every day or week. So we can see that they've sent 24,000 tweets over X amount of years that they've been exi in existence. So you can do the math and find out how often they're tweeting. You can find out how many people they're following and how many followers they have. They have. Just to go back to the example of iPhone accessories, if I have a company that offers iPhone accessories and I'm looking for leads, 
I might want to follow some of the people that I'm more is following. Or better yet, I may want to follow some of the people that follow I more because obviously if they're following them, they're interested in some type of Apple product. And maybe you can add some value to the conversation and somebody says, wow, my, my iPhone screen cracked or I need a new iPhone case. You can be that person that jumps in and adds value and say, hey, why don't you give my website a look? Also following them on, on Facebook, see what they're doing there. Uh, one thing that I noticed from here was that they offered an iPad giveaway down at the bottom. If you are also in this space where you're offering, I guess, rumors, rumor news about Apple products, if you want to drive more people to your website or drive more readers, you can offer a similar type of giveaway and use what they view, the momentum that they built already to help you gain traction within the industry. So you can also find out how many people linked to the iPad giveaway that they sponsored or featured and then you can reach out to those people and say, hey, I noticed that you linked to the iMore iPad giveaway last year, two years ago. I'm having one now and I'm giving away two iPads instead of one. Would you be interested in writing about it or would you be interested in signing up for whatever it is that we are offering at this time? Also, websites seem to be really anxious to let you know where they're hanging out from a social media perspective. So if they have social media channels somewhere on the web, they're going to mention that somewhere on their home page. So I already mentioned Facebook and Twitter for iMore, but we notice here that they also have a Google Plus page, they have an RSS feed, they have a YouTube account, and they also have some stuff on iTunes, which are probably like their podcasts and stuff like that. So if you're trying to get into the industry and get into the space and figure out what's going on, these would be some great first places to look. So what do you learn here? What is their social calendar? How often are they tweeting, updating Facebook posts, Pinterest, pins, etc.? What, con what contest promotions are they running? Can you offer some and would they be better and more comprehensive? What, are the, what followers do they have? What circles are they in? What are other social media channels that they're using? And so this will get you, give, give you a feel for the frequency of the post so that you can keep up or not at least be competitive in that space. So you can run similar promotions and use their momentum to gain traction. Follow their followers and, and add value to the conversation. Be careful not to spam their followers. We don't want you sending out 90,000 messages to their followers saying, hey, I noticed you followed I more. Why don't you follow us? That won't get you very many followers. But if you're adding value to the conversation, I think that would be a great way to engage some of I more's followers. Also, to build out your web presence, Google and the other search engines love to see websites having a comprehensive web presence. So not just having a web page, but also having an optimized Google Plus page, Twitter page, Facebook page, and actually using it and, to, and gaining leads that way is going to show that you have a comprehensive web presence, which the search engines really like. So reputation management will be the last section that I cover here. So how, and this is really important. So how does the, com the community and the industry view the company, the competitor, and what tactics, procedures should you avoid? So AJ Madison is a company that offers appliances, things like refrigerators, televisions, washers, dryers, things like that. So whenever I want to find out what the general consensus is from a reputation perspective, I will just type their brand name into Google and see what pops up. So when I type in AJ Madison, the first thing that comes up is their Yelp page. And I'm pretty sure all you guys know how Yelp works, where basically people go there mainly when they want to complain about stuff, but oftentimes when they want to give praise. However, it looks like they have some information down here from AJ Mattis, excuse me, from Piss Customer, which is never really a good thing. So we can tell now that AJ Madison has an issue with reputation management within the industry. So you can take a look at these reviews, find out why it is that people don't like them. Maybe they're, they use some bait and switch. Maybe they're dishonest there. Maybe they don't deliver on their promises. Maybe some of the people that work there aren't the nicest people. But you can use this information to avoid whatever issues that the competitor is having, and you can use this to capitalize off of that. For instance, if, they're, if their shipping costs are twice as expensive as yours and people are complaining about that, maybe you can take some, some Google ads out, excuse me, some PPC ads. You can bid on some PPC ads mentioning how your prices are a lot more competitive, or at least your shipping prices are a lot more competitive. Also, you can pretty much take any brand's name and attach the word scam to it, and stuff will pop up. So I use Colonial Nissan as an example here, not to pick on anybody, but that was the first thing that came to mind. So Colonial Nissan and the word scam forced ripoff report to come up, and you can read through these, these, these um, reviews that people put inside of here and find out exactly what they're doing wrong and not do those things. The last part of reputation management would be the Google Places section. So Google Places you have the option of signing one up for yourself 
or using one that already existed and somebody else created and claiming it. But what Google Places does is it has this at a glance section here where they give reviews and they also list a couple of keywords that people are using frequently. So you can see here that this person, that this Google Places account, people are using the term Jason Friedman, which is probably a salesperson there, and the term bad reviews. So bad reviews was used a significant amount of time within the review section. So it brought that up to the top. So if I'm skimming over this, the first thing I'm noticing are these three words here, and one of them is bad reviews. I may not want to purchase from them because of that. The second one has bad experience here, and because of that, I may not be one, I may not want to purchase from them either. The last one I have here doesn't have any of these negative keywords. I have two words, competitive price and auto loans. Knowing me, I like to know that a website has a good reputation, so it seems to me that they've been doing a little bit better job or they've been offering better service, so I would be more likely to visit this particular website as opposed to the other two. So what do we learn? How does a community view your competitor? We want to know that so that we can learn from their mistakes. Are their web marketing efforts being overshadowed by their reputation? Are they constantly trying to move things down the search engine results pages because they're viewed in a negative light? Or are they concentrating on doing really cool things? Of course, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, what mistakes did they make and how can you avoid them? And also, it's a good idea to do, do the same type of search for your brand name. How do your customers view you? It's, it's really difficult to point the finger at some of your other competitors when you may be offering the same type of negative service or something even worse. So one thing to do is some action items that come from this are claim your citation listings, something like Yelp, Bing, local, Google Places, Dealer Rater, depending on what industry you're in, there's going to be different local citations to claim those so that you can properly monitor these. Avoid your competitors' mistakes, of course. Communicate with disgruntled customers. Don't let things linger out there. If there are negative reviews on Yelp, Visit their, the, those Yelp pages, leave reviews. There's an opportunity to turn a, turn a positive into a negative, excuse me, turn a negative into a positive, and solicit, it, solicit positive reviews. People actually do read this stuff. So if somebody comes into your restaurant or somebody comes into your dealership or somebody buys something from your store, give them the opportunity to leave a review for you on Yelp or some, one of the other local citation listings so that you can constantly persuade people to purchase from you. So... That is all that I have, guys. I wanted to leave it open for some Q&A. I also have my email address here in case you guys aren't comfortable asking questions in my Twitter profile. So I wanted to leave it open for any questions should anybody have any. Uh, one question that came up, is there going to be a tape session? Yes, there will be a tape session. I'll make this available after the webinar, and we will send a link out for that for everybody that signed up for it. All right, well, if no questions, I thank you guys for listening, and uh, good luck with your competitive analyses. All right, cool. Hopefully you guys learned something. Yeah? Yeah, I stopped. Actually, no, I didn't stop. Uh, I hope not. Hold on, let's take a look. <laughs> think so? What? Well, <laughs> we pointed out that they're doing crappy <laughs> stuff. Yeah, negative reviews. So, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. So I, I, I didn't want to show Gerhards. Yeah, right. Yeah, don't, don't buy from them. Yeah, All right, cool. Here's what not to do. You know, buddy. Why? Why?